Thanks to your generous donations to our Kickstarter funding campaign. Clive Barker Podcast presents Fundraiser 9. Celebrations! Well, welcome. Uh, this is episode 455 of the Clive Barker podcast. And good morning, Jose. Hey, good morning, Ryan. How are we doing today? Good, good. So, all right, you primitive screwheads, listen up. <laughs> this is the, uh, this is, we're continuing. This is actually our last A to Z commentaries, Z for Zombies episode. That's on right. Army of Darkness. If you didn't guess from me saying that, I wouldn't really call all of our listeners' names. But but yeah, Army of Darkness, and we're watching the director's cut or the extended edition. Right, the one that's I think about fifteen minutes longer than the theatrical cut, and even has yeah. a, a different ending. We'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, and I want to throw in a plug, even though they didn't pay us for this or anything. But this Shout Factory 4K uh, Blu-ray yeah. of Army of Darkness has like four versions of the movie in it. It's got a 4K version of the theatrical cut. It's uh-huh. got an HD version of the of all, also of the theatrical cut, and then it's got an HD version of the director's cut and an HD version of it of an international cut, and then and then it's got a television cut. Oh, so it's wow. like that big old box set for Blade Runner, except yeah. it's Army of Darkness. I had no idea there were so many versions. I remember when I was younger, like in high school, renting a laser disc that was from another country because it had this alternate ending on it, you know, before there was the director's cut. Yeah. Cause the, the ending is, is like vastly different. I mean, it, and we'll talk about that when we get there, but and I'm so, wondering if I've seen the international version because I, 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 I lived in Portugal until 2013. So, uh, I must've seen, I must've seen this in uh, different versions in rental and in the theater, I think. I think the one that I rented was like it when it was. I used to have a friend that went to University of Washington, and he would rent stuff from Scarecrow Video from me in the University District. Okay, and bring the laser discs over to my house, and then we'd watch them. And you know, I think it was Japanese, The Army of Darkness, that I watched because I, I think it had Japanese subtitles. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, uh, was it and what kind of cover was discs. it? Was it the classic cover, or did the Japanese laser disc have a different cover? No, I think it was the classic cover. <clears throat> okay, okay, the painted one with the princess, you know, yeah, by his feet. Okay, yeah, the, that, the that was the first one. Is, it's eighty-one minutes, and I think the international cut is eighty-eight minutes, and then you've yeah. got the the director's cut. Uh, the, the the TV cut is ninety minutes long, I think, and then you have the yeah. director's cut, uh, which in this case, I think it's. Uh, yeah, ninety six minutes, something like that. I watched the H, the UHD, the four K theatrical Steel cut, book. and it it looked amazing. And then I watched the international cut, and that was like just like the theatrical cut. I mean, I, there wasn't really much difference on it. Sure. So the one that's in this set, and then I watched like some extras and stuff, and I didn't want to get burned out on the movie before. You know, I planned on watching all the versions, but I w- was starting to f- get a little burned out, and I didn't want to feel like that when we did our commentary, so I, I quit. I understand. I think the the only two that probably are worth watching are the, the director's cut and the theatrical. And um, I agree. Yeah. The international I mean, I'm version. I'm curious about the, the TV cut, because I'm wondering uh-huh. if it's going to have, like, the, you know, the dubbed-in replacement lines. Sure. Yeah, I'm sure that will have that. Yep. If it's a those TV can, version, those can be funny sometimes. Although there's not a whole lot of swearing in this movie, it's actually pro- well. We'll we'll talk about that. But it sh- this probably should have been a PG-13 movie and not a rated R movie. Yeah, unfortunately, there's so much blood in this, and uh, I, I I know that they had some issues with that, and uh, mm-hmm. they they were telling them uh, here that what certificate are we supposed to get, and they were like, well, you're going to get an R. And they were like, well, well tell us or, what to cut. And, originally, and they, were like, they, were, they weren't even – they had to fight to get an R. They weren't going to even be – because, like, 
the ratings board was upset with them because of Evil Dead 1 and 2 that were unrated. Right. And so they're like, they said, well, what do we need to cut then to get this to an R? And they said, well, it's not so much what to cut. It's a cumulative effect. Yeah. That's what, and, and uh, I, was, I was listening to this with, with Bruce Campbell in an interview, and he was saying that. And he said what they ended up doing was just giving him the same movie again. Uh-huh. <laughs> Didn't cut anything, and then, and then it got an R rating. Well, you know, there's that. This is a R-rated director's cut, and uh, I've got this movie pulled up to the MGM uh, logo with the Leo the Lion. Yeah, usual. yeah, me too. Yeah, so you want to do the countdown so we can get this started? All right, here we go. Three, two, one, play. Okay, All he right. just roared right in my ear. <laughs> so this is like, I think it was the first and only movie that, uh, 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 Evil Dead movie that, and at a studio production and distribution, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, they had to deal with, they had to deal with the studio um, wanting to edit it their way, which is why we're watching a director's cut right now, because the theatrical cut is not exactly the way they wanted it. Right, but right. it had to do with test screenings and public feedback and stuff. Now, we have, uh, we have Bruce Campbell here, uh, opening sequence. Uh, we've got... Any good quest movie starts with our protagonist either arrested or, you know, being introduced or <laughs> right. escaping prison and then, you know, yeah. doing whatever. So this is no different. We've got uh, we've got Bruce Campbell here narrating uh, where he came from and what happened yeah. to him. Yeah. And and uh, so Bridget Fonda is as Linda, right? She's the third actress to play Linda. And um, apparently she approached uh, Sam Raimi because she was a big fan of the Evil Dead movies and she said she just wanted to be a part of it somehow. Yeah. That's how it goes. Yeah. So she ended up just being in a couple of scenes. I think she might have just worked a day or two in the movie. Um, mm-hmm. She shows up uh, in the reconstruction of the part where uh, she gets uh, kidnapped possessed. here. Yeah. Possessed, yeah. And then they redid the scene um they put her in the scene as Linda at the end sequence as well and at the beginning. Yeah, and in and, and the S Mart. Yep. So most of this is recreated, most of this stuff from Evil Dead 2, but there is Yeah, so that's her. But there but a lo- some of this is straight out of Evil Dead 2. Yeah, yeah. A lot of this footage is the recap comes from the the, yeah. the second movie, that's right. Good stuff here where he cuts his hand off and the animation with his hand being possessed and getting all that black veiny stuff. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a great uh, recap and really gets you into the, um, the action. Yeah. I want to talk about the title here because I think it's really interesting in this title card that they don't say Ash versus army of darkness. They say Bruce Campbell versus army of darkness. Oh yeah, oh. not the not the character, but the actor. It's kind of I don't know if I've ever seen that on another movie. Uh, and the, the making of was called Medieval Times: The Making of Army yeah, of Darkness. Yeah, I think that was made. That one was made by Shout Factory. Oh, look at that! Bruce Campbell being made out of like ectoplasm. Ghost. Yeah, yeah. Versus Bruce Campbell versus Army of Darkness. There we go. You're watching the 4K Steelbook on your computer? No, I'm watching. I'm watching the one that you sent because okay. it makes it it's easier just, to put it in yeah. another screen on the TV. Blamo! So there was a, a big accident when they were trying to shoot this scene for this movie the first time. I think they had a, a crane. They were trying to get the car. Yeah. Drop scene, and then apparently it was too close to the edge, and the whole crane just fell over the, into the quarry, and they and had the, to get a bigger crane. And the crane operator had to jump out, and luckily he didn't get hurt. Yeah. But I think they ended up going with like, hey, you know, we actually did this scene pretty good in the second movie, so let's just put that in there. Yeah, they said after all that, and they finally did it, the, it's like the one in Evil Dead 2 looked better. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got, he, he went back, right? So the at the end of the second one, he the they read the recitation, they opened the portal 
to yeah. take the monster back in time, and he ended up getting sucked into it. And now he's in the 14th century, right? Yeah. And so for people that, that d- maybe don't remember in Evil Dead 2 right at the end, the, you know, there was a scene in the where they were looking at the book, and, oh, they, he, that's the one who's prophesied to, you know, to stop the evil or whatever. And he goes, yeah. well, I guess they didn't do a good, very good job. Uh-huh. So it's kind of a really cool little bit of foreshadowing for this movie. Yeah, and you see the engraving of a guy holding what seems to be like a, a blade, but it's really a chainsaw in his hand. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Really I love cool. this guy. I love this Merlin dude here. This wizard yeah. guy. That's great. That was an aluminium armor. Uh, those al- armors are made of yeah. aluminum, and uh, it got really, really hot in the desert when they were shooting this movie. Yeah, uh, that was shot in California in a gravel pit. This part. That's right. That's right. I think that 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 actor, uh, the Lord, that's uh, got the armor and oh yeah, had had his sword up. Um, Arthur. He he with that armor under the sun, it would sometimes be 110, and he would get up to 130 apparently. So he would oh. be he would be sweating a lot in that. Yeah. Oh, that's a great transition there with the glint glinting yeah. sunlight off of the. Uh, Chainsaw. Take him to the pit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. And the guy that's whipping him is the one that later on, you know, says, my sword by your side. Uh-huh. <laughs> Isn't he also the guy that he says, who wants more? Do you want some more? When he comes out yeah, of the pit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I think he's he's still remembering him whipping him when they were walking over to the castle. So that's uh, that's Kandar Castle. Is that yeah, th- yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So it, where do you suppose? I mean, I guess it's supposed to be in England, right? I mean, it looks like it's in the middle of nowhere, but they everybody mm-hmm. speaks English, and and uh, Henry seems like he's Irish. Yeah, the C- Castle Kandar uh, was an ancient castle located in England during the 14th century. Says hmm. here, when the castle was under the rule of Lord Arthur, the the dude with the blue eyes, uh, in 1300 AD, which is the time of the movie, yeah. the prophesies here from the sky rise in the future to battle an army of the dead and evil forces yeah. unleashed upon the land. So it was first mentioned in the Evil Dead, and it appears uh, in briefly in the in the previous movie. Yep, yep. Yeah, I don't think it was in the first Evil Dead at all. Yeah. They don't. Uh, they don't say exactly where it's supposed to be, but the, yes, it's in England. And the wild. Yeah, but it's England. weird because they call them Kandarian demons, which almost you know sounds like you know Mesopotamian or. But it. But uh, Kandar is really just the castle, I guess. It's not the country. Yeah, it was Kandar Castle. Yeah, that's yeah. that's how it shows up in the Evil Dead wiki. Yeah, Kandar was a city in Mesopotamia, right? I think. Was it? Um, yeah, I think so. Or yeah. at least that's the lore of this. So you mean the made-up castle of Kandar? Yeah, yeah, the castle of Kandar. Yeah, obviously. yeah, yeah. Not. I mean, it's, that that blacksmith guy is a big friend of the Raimi brothers. Yeah, right, right. And he shaved his head for the movie. Yeah. Good stuff. Look at that pit. Yeah. Ah, that's so cool. I mean, that just looks like something straight out of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Is that is that uh, that piece of metal and wood that was around his arms and shoulders? Is that like, uh, what do you call that thing? It's um, not like what they put on... S- stock, I think. Stock, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks almost like the stuff they put on like um, bulls to pull plows and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Well, like, hey, hello, great. Mr. Fancy Pants. <laughs> I can't believe that they, uh, that they, uh, you know, the beginning of Skyrim looks a lot like the beginning of this movie. Because mm. <laughs> you're also caught with like a guy, a lord who's uh, oh. subversive, and they're like, dude, they're going to execute you because they think you're in league with him and all that stuff. And then, oh, really? Yeah, that doesn't happen. Lord Arthur. Yeah. He, he probably one of the only British people in this uh, in this movie. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, this is supposed to be the uh, the the. This is during the Age of Darkness. Um, apparently, Kendarian demon have been roaming around the dark forest outside of uh, Arthur's territory, and they've been turning people into deadites. So in yeah. this in this world in this reality of the movie, the deadites have kind of been a thing throughout history, I guess. Yeah. All right. Playing Compu- on the idea that in the Dark Ages there really the his, there wasn't much written history, and uh, I love this walk the plank thing into the pit here. Yeah, that's just so cool. So this guy yep. that gets thrown in here, I mean, I know you'd said there was a lot of blood, but I think it's all right here in this one scene. Well, yeah, I guess it, because there's a lot of other uh, scenes where uh, w- when they're fighting skeletons, they don't really bleed. Of course, you're right. Yeah, yeah. but there is a lot of the cumulative effect uh, kind of gets <laughs> it to you after a while. And it, there was a, in, I think it's probably you. I think you and I watched the same uh, the same featurette, but there yeah. was a, a thing where the editor was trying to talk to Dino De Laurentiis about, like, you know, um, because De De Laurentiis wanted to, he said, there's way too many of these exploding skeletons. You need to take, leave it to, like, four and and get rid of the rest of them. And uh, and Sam Raimi told him, hey, look, uh, this guy's old. He doesn't remember things, so just leave him in there anyway. And then they're, like, laughing at him because this guy went to... Dealer enters. He goes, "What are you, an idiot? You don't take notes. I told you to get rid of these." <laughs> they really uh, put him in a, a tough spot there. Yeah, I mean, I feel for him. Yeah, Daniel De Laurentiis was. Uh, he could be pretty hands on with his movies that he produced. Yeah. He liked it. He liked big, like uh, set pieces and stuff. I think yeah. it really comes through in this movie, even though it's a kind of a lower budget, but uh, probably as bigger budget as this franchise ever had. And he was pushing for having a. a- more shapely female character. Yeah. And they said, no, she's perfect. You know, they really fought for her. Yeah. Yeah. Which they good job there. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to, um, I was listening to Roger Ebert and, um, what was the other guy? Uh, Ebert and, uh, Siskel. Yeah. A review of this movie. And, um, yeah, Ebert said something. I, I didn't think it was fair. He said that this movie didn't really seem like it had a love interest. And, um, Although I'll agree that that she she's not really like, you know, I mean the typical love interest. I think she works fine as the as the love interest in this movie. Um, yeah. Even though, of course, when he goes back to, oh yeah, well, we'll get into the alternate endings later. But yeah. Well, and yeah, and and that kind of annoys me too. That that uh, you know the idea that you have to have a a love interest. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it, it's. They've got other things going on, you know, in this movie that they probably don't have time to focus too hard on that. Yeah, and I I agree, for example, that, uh, you know, he's he's a man out of time and he's kind of an outsider. And I feel like uh, Mm. he doesn't want to stay here. So, yeah, I guess I could see why the love interest thing feels a little, you know, uh, kind of. I wouldn't say tacked on or forced, but it, it just feels like, hey, he's just there for a while and he's he's kind of being a charmer and whatever. And, and she, you know, they never yeah. really become an item. But uh, right. Right. I think yeah. that's fine. I think it's just part of the character, who he is and their relationship. Yeah. And then he come, goes back to the to the um, the past, the, the, the future, I guess. Sorry. Well, and I think one maybe one maybe more interesting aspect is is Ash's personality. I mean, the. His the way he's evolved over the the course of these movies. He used to be a really nice guy, you know, in in Evil Dead Two. Yeah, and, in the car and talking to his girlfriend, being all yeah. you know. And and the, he's kind of become what they call him an, an a hole, pretty much. And uh-huh. you know, in this commentaries and stuff, and in the interviews, and they're like, "Why did you make him like that?" Because because it's funny. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, that's why everybody loves this character. You know, yeah, I mean, Bruce Campbell has become. So some actors they can turn themselves into completely different people. They can be unrecognizable for each movie. But yeah. then there's the other actors who are really good at playing a version of themselves every time, right? And I think yeah. I think Bruce Campbell falls into that latter category. 
He's a really good well, actor, but uh, he, he has a very distinct, like, Bruce yeah. Campbell role that he brings to uh, every character. Well, and, and also, you know, his uh, his skill fighting the, the, the undead, right? He's yeah. like a superhero with that, but in every other aspect of his life, he's not so great. Right. It's like he's he's kind of prophesied to be the hero, right? But yeah. uh but when it comes to other things he's not really that much of a success. Um Yeah. And this this is uh one of Ed's favorite deadites right here. Uh Ed couldn't be with us today on the podcast. He yeah. wasn't feeling really up to snuff today. So we're sorry he couldn't make it, but uh this he he has a mask of this character in, in his house. It's uh the pit bitch or the pit yeah. hag. That's what they and, like to and call And the, the they the special effects people created that and they showed it to um and they showed it to Sam Raimi and he said no I don't want that. But mm-hmm. then they kind of fought for it and they're like, well, you know, can't you think of a place you could put this? And they said, what about in the pit? And he's like, oh, that's great. I love that. Yeah, good call. Yeah, I just love this uh, <laughs> this fight. It's just so cool. Yeah. And it does look different from other deadites. Yeah, yeah, this one does. Oh, chomp. He got caught in the jaws of I, death. I want to know how the, the, the pit creature gets out of the, you know, at the at the end of the scene. Oh, all yeah, of a sudden right? it's standing it on the lip. One. It just got crushed by that by those spikes. It should be, yeah, I know. Yeah, it shouldn't physically be able to get out of there. Yeah. It's uh but it's a heck of a it makes for a heck of a, a ending to that sequence I guess yeah. it's it's really so cool. Th- there's a deleted scene where uh, Arthur like sucker punched him, you know, mm-hmm. where where he had explained who he was and and uh Arthur walked up to him and then hit him in the head with the hilt of his sword. Yeah. And so that that's kind of leads up to this this scene of him sucker punching Arthur. Comeback punch, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he's not as much of a jerk as it seems like. As There's the guy with the whip. Yeah, you. He wants to have a little. <laughs> you. It's like, what, what, me? And everybody starts stepping away from him like, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Want some more? Huh? Yeah. Damn, dude. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so much more humor in this one than the last one. I mean, the last one was also funny, but this one goes really out in some sequences. It's just so funny. Well, and they had to explain to the producers that, you know, hey, this this one's not a horror movie. This is an adventure movie. It's a quest for a book. They said, yeah, Evil Dead 1 was horror. Evil Dead 2 was comedy horror. And Evil Dead 3 is is an adventure movie. Yep, yep. That's Duke Henry the Red, played by Richard Grove. Yeah. <clears throat> he said in Sounds- an interview that he became friends with the actor who played Arthur. Oh, cool. <clears throat> and this guy is not he, he's not American. I mean, he's not a, a British. He's actually American. No. He's born in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> yeah. Like, ah, uh, thanks for you. Thank you, generous hosts. <laughs> yeah. Sword boy. And that's kind of a weird running gag that they don't put a lot of attention to, but he's got a sword boy and a torch boy. Yeah. Well, what what do they usually call um the sword boy? A Wasn't page. It, uh, a yeah. page, that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Every uh night. Oh that that was that was a great shot. Yeah. You primitive screw heads, listen up. <laughs> this here is my boomstick. I remember having this. Um, I had the um, Primitive Screwhead Edition. I think it was German. Oh, yeah. And it comes with like an audio track in German some t- uh, that you can switch to. So when this part comes, it's like, das ist mein Boomstick. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's just oh, great. I have the, I have the Boomstick Edition, which was like a, a limited double disc uh, from Anchor Bay. Everybody admiring the Remington. Yeah. That's right. Shop smart. Shop. S smart. <laughs> yeah. So, ah, so, so good. Touches me. Yeah. <laughs> Next to the primates. Uh, that's such a good, good wardrobe too. Uh, bam. There we go. With the creatures out of the pit. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. I love it. How they just teeter there on the, 
the yeah. edge and it goes on forever. And then he good old Sam Raimi with his predator angles. And there was a, a there there was a behind the scenes moment of showing the the actor f- back flipping into the pit, and mm-hmm. everybody when he did it, everybody cheered because it looked like such a tough stunt to do. <clears throat> There's a lot of acrobatics with the deadites, isn't there? Like yeah. in the original ending, uh, where we had that deadite inside S Mart jumping around. Yeah. Like, there's like there's like a off of a, trampolines a, and stuff. A trampoline, right? There's like a yeah. trampoline, and then there's like jumping and going around the ceiling and getting shot yeah. while flying in the air. It's just crazy. He's just sitting there, like picking out. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, there really is not much of a reason why they would give in to him just after that. I I get it. He shot and broke the sword and they're all kind of intimidated by him. But at the same point, it's like, I don't know why Lord Arthur wouldn't just be like, okay, well, I think now, now they believe that he's the one in the prophecy. Oh yeah. The wizard, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think now when they come in, right. Do you think that Mm -hmm. he already, do you think this is the first time they're establishing this or do you think that the wizard already explained to Lord Arthur? He, he, yeah, he told him at the beginning of the movie that he, I think he's the one who's prophesied and he's like, more likely he's one of King Henry's men. Right. Sorry, I had the uh, the sound off, uh, so I missed that part. Oh, uh oh, there's soup on the floor. This scene oh, was I originally a lot bigger, and it was in a big chamber with columns and stuff, and it was just was too expensive. Yeah, it was written that way, right? Yeah, and so they cut it out, and then they re- put this back in in a in this more abbreviated way with reshoots, and yeah. that witch is Patricia Talman. I think Howard Berger in the making of also mentioned something that uh, they shot this sequence in a garage in two days. Right. Yeah. 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 Because um, they needed the sequence, but they didn't have the money to make the bigger sequence. So they shot it in a garage. They're like, yep, don't touch her. It's a trick. Get an axe. Bam. <laughs> There's only one thing about the Deadites that. Uh, they kind of, you know, I mean, it's a little annoying, but uh, it's usually like it's shoot them until they decide not to get up anymore. But it yeah, never really explains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah like, the, the, what's the, the difference between about, shooting them like 10 times versus 15 times? Yeah. The rules about how to kill a deadite seem to vary depending on the one. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and what looks cool. It works well and it definitely looks cool, though. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, this to me yeah. is definitely a PG thirteen movie. I mean, when he shoots these things, you don't even see the you don't even see the damage. That's right. Yeah, no blood and n- nothing. Yeah. Oh, Versus you see Evil that, Dead, that... even Evil Dead two, the, there were body parts flying around and stuff. This sequence was totally like a uh, samurai Bruce Lee kind of thing, right? Yeah. Where the guy like turns around and stabs someone with his sword through the body, and then just goes like, whoa. Yeah. Release the tension. Move that chi. All right. Here we go. New <laughs> prosthetic. Yeah. There's some stuff that really stretches the uh, stretches the, the suspension of disbelief. <laughs> Him building his robot hand because his, his trunk just happened to be full of textbooks, science textbooks. <laughs> It's all because Tony Stark <coughs> built it in a cave from scraps. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, what do you call that thing? A, a manacle or a, a, a gauntlet? A gauntlet, yeah. Yeah, a gauntlet. I mean, yeah, some some shots it looks – I i don't know how this looks in 4K, but uh, some shots – it looks cool. Some shots, it looks like a giant plastic glove, but uh, yeah, like a power glove. Yeah. Uh, well, right now I'm just watching the same one you are, but but yeah. um, I watched the theatrical cut in 4K, and the rest of them were in just regular HD. Thou well, art the promised one. Um, so I think Bruce Campbell at this point was married to his wife, who was also the costumer for this movie i think so, yeah i uh, think they got married right before the movie started oh yeah that was it and uh 
There was a time when they he got injured on on set. I think uh, a piece of his armor or his chest armor, his chin, his face got caught on it, and it kind of sliced him. So mm. he had all those like other uh, fake scars on. And when they took him to the hospital, uh, the the uh, the responders didn't know which which injuries were actually real oh, and which ones yeah. they had to treat. So they had to like point them out. Hey, this one right here. That was a cape, dude. That was not a horse blanket. I know. Bam. It's... She gave you a cape to go quest. Yeah. Magic cape with a buff of plus three charisma. <laughs> I don't know what else a cape could buff. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, there's a cloak of protection. There's armor class. And I guess there might be for um, bards. Are there cloaks that uh, give them uh, buffs for their singing? Mm, I, I'm, I'm not sure offhand. I don't know. All right. Ash is uh, taking advantage of that plus five charisma right here. All right. They hooked up. Ash scored. Well, you know, you got to you gotta give the hero something to... Uh, to fight for, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and it, and it does become important at the end when he's, you know, he's about to chicken out and leave, but then uh, then she had given him a reason to fight. I really dig the weave on that cape, though. Yeah, it's really cool. All right, little glass shot here. <clears throat> Fanfare music. Yeah. We're going to uh, Nottingham Forest. <laughs> it's really interesting, the shot of the windmill, when they explain that the windmill was just a little three-foot model in, in, the front, in the foreground, and, they had, and then they had him walking up to it in the background to make it look bigger. That's a clever trick. Yeah. All right, this is as far as we go. Now you have to yeah. go the rest of the way. This is so quest like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I wonder. I wonder really why none of the rest of them would even go with him. Yeah, right. I guess it's just because that that's the way. It's the prophecy, right? The hero yeah. has to quest, and he he has to be the one. Because if someone else tries to do yeah. it, it's not going to work. Well, if the old man had just gone with him, maybe he could have reminded him what the words are. <laughs> I know your damn words. Yep, yep. You know, that cape weave actually almost, uh, I don't know if that, it's got two colors on it. It makes it look almost like chain mail, right? Yeah, yeah, it does a little bit. Wow. He, he was complaining about how bad his horse riding was in this, because he was bouncing too much. The uh, ass saddle battle. Yeah. Because apparently he kept slamming up and down on the horse. I don't. Uh, I don't have any experience riding horses. Did no, you ever I, ride a horse, Ryan? My mom owned horses, but I don't really like them that much. Oh, really? Did she have like a little ranch or something? No, she just like no, not really a ranch. She okay, just had, you know, big property and had gotcha. a couple of horses. My stepsister was the one that was really into them for a while, and then she wasn't, and then my mom had to take care of them. Yeah. Uh oh, we got the fog coming in. Yeah, and it's a sunny day, so this fog is. Uh, yeah, it's the same fog we saw in the second movie and the first movie. Right. Yep. And then we're gonna see the the evil, you know, from its point of view, like you know, it was just st- staple of the Evil Dead movies. This is a typical questing scene, right? The hero is uh, the horse is scared, and he's in the middle of the forest, and uh, yeah. something's something's chasing him. And here we go. All I can think about when I see the camera on this is, uh, you know, how sometimes bullfighters they will have instead of having a bull in the ring to practice, they'll just have a guy with a little um, with a little uh, little cart, and he'll. He'll have little horns on the on the end of the cart, and they'll just run around on a one wheel trying to chase the horse. No, I've never seen that. Yeah, they do that for practice. Um, yeah. Bullfighters. So I always thought, I always thought that's what it feels like. It feels like someone put the camera in one of those little carts and is moving yeah. it around. All 
I think that Kendarian demon probably can outpace him at any speed he can go. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, even when he was like running in the woods in Evil Dead Two, he was able to get into the house. Oh, and there he goes straight into the fluid, and it tricked him, tricked the demon. It this went is right a very, past him. Yeah, a very similar beat to the one on the second movie, right? When he gets possessed by the demon. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of lame that the studio wouldn't let them call it, uh, you know... Evil Dead 3. Evil Dead or, 3, or Medieval yeah. Dead was one of the names they had for it. It's a minor peeve, but yeah, it's Evil yeah. Dead, Evil Dead 2... Here's that shot I was Evil talking Dead about. 3. Oh, yeah, there it is. So that's only a three-foot model in the foreground. So it's a forced perspective shot or something? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Hey, but this one is not a little cabin in the woods. It's made out of stone, so. Yeah. The 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 scene in the windmill was a lot. They shot a lot more stuff with it. It was like 20 minutes longer. It's pretty long in the director's cut too, right? It, yeah, I'm, I haven't seen this one in a while. I'm trying to remember because I, I watched every other version. And the battle is longer in this version too. Yeah. I got the same vibe watching the movie, the director's cut that I did watching the the Cabal cut for Nightbreak. Right, because it's like yeah. the battle kept going on and on and on. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is kind of the same vibe. And they used alternate takes for his line after he shoots evil Ash. You know, there's one where he says, good, bad, I'm the guy with the gun. I prefer there's that. Another, there's another one where he says, I'm not so good. I don't know In which this one, one. This, this one is. Uh, this one is the one where he says, I'm not so good. Oh, okay. But I always thought that in that one, the theatrical version, I think, is better. The one that we yeah. says, good, bad, I'm the guy with the gun. Yeah. So it's like it's a uh, – nighttime is falling really fast, right? It's getting all dark and yeah. stormy and uh, yeah, and very, very still. Just like when you're in the eye of a storm. There we go. I'm trying to remember, is, is, is does this, because there's a scene where he's outside and he sees Ash in the windmill and he runs in and runs into the mirror. It's right here. Yeah. Yeah. But, but in the, in the deleted scene, he was actually outside and saw him standing in the doorway, I think, of the windmill. I didn't see the theatrical for this one. I just saw the director's cut. That, well, that was just in a deleted scene in the special oh i see one thing i i think is really cool is that this windmill kind of reminds me of the windmill and the frankenstein films from universal right oh i don't know if you noticed that oh this this is my favorite part yeah all the little ashes running around can you imagine how hard it would have been to create all this well, you can see usually there's only one that's Bruce Campbell and the other two, if you look at their faces, it, it, it's similar to him, but not yeah. really. You can tell they're different people. Yeah. I think they might have had some masks and stuff, but uh, yeah. you can still see some of these guys are not Ash. Uh, fork in the butt classic. Yeah. <laughs> what I like is the foreshadowing in Sam Raimi's shots. You can tell yeah. exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. I, I'm a sucker for like giant prop sets. Oh, yeah. I just love seeing that when they have like a big broom or what. Oh, this part. Ah. Yeah. What actually what's happening to him right now is is uh really exaggerated compared to the damage that's done to his face afterwards. It's just well, a clearly. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird how uh, really hot things or really cold things can yeah. stick to you. Right. Right. Did you ever, uh, in Alaska, do you ever have problems with like getting your hands stuck on, on railings or anything like that? Oh yeah. You, yeah. That's yeah. pretty common in the winter time. I hate that. This part, you can tell it's a wire job, but but still, yeah. I think they did a good job removing the wire. Yeah. Oh. Oh. 
roasted buns. Oh yeah. What's what's that thing that uh, fell on his head? Is that supposed to be a, a bucket of curdled milk? I'm not sure. That's gross. Yeah, and in the in the international cut, all of a sudden he just woke up and they had tied him up. There wasn't all of this build up to him getting knocked out and stuff. Yeah, that that wouldn't make a lot of sense for me. No, it was annoying. Yeah. I didn't like the international cut. I was kind of felt like I wasted my time watching that one. Yeah, because it has some of the director's cut scenes that are not in the theatrical, but not yeah. all of it. Yeah. yeah, I think this is better. <laughs> that stupid pipe. Yeah. Well, and yeah. and yeah. you know, and then the, it, this the the difference with the ending kind of brings up the question of like, well, what's canon then? What actually well, happened? I mean, I guess in Ash versus Evil Dead, obviously he didn't get stuck in the future. Yeah, I think the canon part is the theatrical, right? Because yeah, cause that's but, what they but it's for. not what they wanted. Uh, I mean, th- that was the result of a test test screenings and stuff, and the producers forced them to m- make that ending. Yeah, because they I wanted think on, it, on, on season full- three. I was reading about that. Didn't they have a, a part where Ash goes into a, a po- apocalyptic ending on season three? I don't, re- I don't, I don't remember. Because I haven't seen the show, that's why I'm saying that. No, I mean he has, go- he went back in time, but I don't think he went. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I'd have to watch it again. And now we got the Gulliver's Gulliver's Travels scene yeah, uh, yeah. that we're talking about. Yep. Everybody it, remembers it, this from Gulliver's Travels, but there was another one where he was little and the, the, he was there were giants. That's a really weird book. Yeah, and there's one where it's talking horses. Yeah, and there's the yahoos that throw feces at him. Oh, my God, look at this guy. This scene always bothered me. Oh, because it's so obviously, like, optical. Well, I mean, you're right about that. That's true. But it was more like the idea of of swallowing that guy. Oh, I see. And then drinking the boiling hot water. His his solution to it, yeah. (laughs) It's like, I know what I'll do. I'll drink boiling water. That would hurt him way more than it would hurt the thing in his stomach. It's because it's so relatable. We've all been there. We've all had coffee that was way too hot, yeah. put it in our mouth, and swallowed it yeah. to scorch our throat anyway. Well, and I think that, you know, by the time it gets down to your stomach, it's not going to do as much damage as it is doing to his mouth and his throat and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's not that far going down your gullet, but uh, sure. I think it'll cause a lot of damage. Yeah. Uh-oh. Homer is growing a second head. Yeah. Oh, it's Mr. Burns. <laughs> Look, this mouth this mouth eye thing is just <laughs> completely disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that, God, that, that line looking. seems like it was it was uh eighty yard in there to, to explain something oh, yeah. that maybe I wasn't agree. you know they didn't weren't able to show are those joshua tre- no they're not joshua trees and this is one of my favorite shots in the whole movie it's him outside fighting with himself with the two yeah. heads so weird i know it's always great to see a character with two heads i mean um they fought beeble brocks and the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy oh, yeah. he mm-hmm. has two heads it's a little challenging yeah. back then because See this part with the optical uh, thing? You can tell that one of them is a first a, a first exposition, and then you have the second exposition that, that makes the first one look a little duller. Yeah. And when you see the mask in actual shots where it's him with a prop head, if you look at it, I mean, in the 4K version, you probably can see the head is not even moving. Oh, yeah, sometimes. Separated. Mirror skit. Yeah. Are you me? <laughs> the Deadites always sound like amused children. The naughty children, right? Yeah. Man, this this little this old jig dance, it's a clear yeah. distraction, dude. Come on. Yeah. Pow. Pow. This is very Three Stooges. Yeah. Slapstick humor completely. Oh. Yeah. Bam. 
Oh, did you see the the way that tree wobbled? Yeah. Good heavens. I ain't good. that good. So, yeah, and the damage to his face is a pretty uh, minimal compared to what he did to him. Well, I mean, in real life, he wouldn't have a head later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'd be a little hard to, to, mm. to get that character to walk around. Yeah. All right. I love it when he does these uh, fade to black transitions in between yeah. shots. Yeah. It gives uh, it almost a, like a trailer feel. And it, and it's a callback to the to Evil Dead 2 when he's chaining up Linda in the, sh- in the work shed. Right, of course, we got to ask. Uh, the movie never really gets into how he gets gasoline for his um, chainsaw, but, you know. Well, yeah, on on the uh, the tagline was like trapped in time, you know, fighting evil and running out of gas or something like that. But he never really runs out of gas. Yeah, that's fair, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Is that a back projection there? It looks like back seemed, projection. Yeah, I on think this so. One. And it's, that that scene is also interesting because um, in Evil Dead one and two, right, he's cutting up the person that he loves most, which is Linda. And then in army of darkness, the person he loves most is himself. And he's cutting him up with a chainsaw. (laughs) Blah, blah, blah. (laughs) I love this part. (laughs) Blah, 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 blah. This is this blah, is probably blah, blah, one of blah, my blah. favorite movies ever. I love Army of Darkness. Yeah, You'll I would die put this before in the top you get 10. it. Yeah, I would put. You'd put it um, in your top ten. When, yeah, when when he was um, when he was riding into the path that the wizard told him. He was riding into a desert of rocks, and all of a sudden he's in a big forest. But uh, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff like that that you just have to kind of let it go. Oh, I love this little cemetery. It's so mm-hmm. spooky. Well, and and another scene of suspension of disbelief here is is when he gets sucked into that you know the one of the wrong books. And then he yeah. climbs out again. That looks like there's no way anybody could could find their way back out of that. <laughs> he, he has like three or four books here to pick. Is that right? Uh, three. Yeah. Two yes. of them are. Yeah. One of them sucks him into a vortex, and the it's other. Like, what one is this? Like, a game show? <laughs> flies around and bites him. Oh, and the, and the soundtrack here is really nice too. Yeah. Yeah, and the soundtrack of the movie is all done by one person except for The March of the Dead was by Danny Elfman. And and when you hear that, it makes you think of Nightbreed. Oh, little aside here. I, I just got the two-CD Entrada release of the Nightbreed soundtrack, and I'm going to oh, be nice. listening to that today. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah, we'll have to do a, an episode about it. Yeah, I'm looking forward it, to it. It's tricky to talk about music and not be able to play it you know in the podcast though yeah that's true it's like wait a minute well you're lucky yeah. there's not a, a, a an imp popping out of the altar and being like hey welcome <laughs> traveler <laughs> yeah the, this this monologue is a little bit for moving this story forward because he's got nobody to talk to He's doing some exposition to himself. So I'm going to guess you saw this movie in the theater when it came out, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and actually one interesting thing about it was um, there was a newspaper ad, and my dad saw it first. And he's like, hey, what? You know, look at this. You know, he's like trapped in time, fighting the ultimate evil and low on gas. And I looked at that newspaper ad, and it said Army of Darkness. I'm like, is that Evil Dead? Three and he, I said, I think that's Evil Dead Three. He goes, No, that's not. It doesn't say that. I said, Well, but I think it is. I think that's Evil Dead Three. 
you know, we didn't have the internet or anything. Yeah, so clearly you knew more about the franchise than your dad at that point. So yeah, yeah. good catch. Yeah, I mean, just the seeing, fact that it had Bruce Campbell, right? Yeah, with the chainsaw on his arm. He, he looks like that night breathe with a long face. Remember that? <laughs> right, yeah. This is Whoa. pure slapstick. Wrong book. Yep. It would be easy to make that book, though, um, the one that has the hole. All you got to oh, do is yeah. just make a hollow book and then find a way to put a circle in there and then just wrap the pages around that circle and make it a, oh, a black yeah. a black hole. It would be cool. Interdimensional portal not included. Yeah. He's like, oh, th- th- I like this scene because he's like, oh, no, that's too obvious of a choice. You're not going to fool me. And mm-hmm. he grabs this other one and it <laughs> jump. Yeah. So the obvious choice was the right choice. He should have gone for the one on the top. I mean, that's a rookie mistake, Ash. You pick the book with your metal hand. Yeah. Which can take any damage. Yeah. The mime skills that he puts into this scene are kind of crazy. Yeah. Oh, ah, boom. There we go. <laughs> oh, you. I'll get back to you. <laughs> He's like planning on coming back and fighting that book later. Spoiler, he does not do that. No. Klaatu. Yep. Yeah, this is Holy probably spell. the scene where where that makes you kind of the maddest at this character. Like, come on, really? It's funny though, because it's something that we never thought, right? It's like, okay, so the hero is going to get there. He's got the thing, and now he's just got to say the words and take it home. And yeah. boom, he doesn't know the last word. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, gee, well, you could have written it down. Something. It's it's an N word. It's definitely yeah. an N word. Oh my god, man. Mm-hmm. Well, and then Lots in the you. alternate ending, which I think is the ending that we're going to see on this one, right? Mm-hmm. He does it again. I think I see. I saw a picture while I was looking around for stuff about the movie. I saw a picture where he had his he had his kids in Army of Darkness. Yeah, oh, he's really? dressed. He's dressed in like the courtyard of the castle, and his two kids are with him. I didn't know he had kids. Yeah, apparently. Hmm. I'm just reading the caption behind the scenes of Army of Darkness with Bruce Campbell and his kids. Ah. Oh. Looks like he buys his kids' clothes at S-Mart. That's a comment on the picture. I like how he's arguing with the environment. I said the words I did. He's uh, arguing with the fates. Yeah. Wait a minute. Stop doing whatever you're doing because I said them. Meanwhile. Oh, no, it's in the theatrical ending where he he misspeaks the words again. And in this one, he just miscounts the number of drops. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So does this version, I can't remember because now, because I just watched all those alternate scenes and stuff. Does this version have the scene where he rides out to go, you know, ask King Henry for help? I think so. Okay. Because that, I, you know, that seems like something they should have put back in the movie because... King Henry oh, just kind of shows up and helps them. Oh, I love this. That all the skeleton yeah. hands coming out. Yeah. And the slapstick. Yeah. Uh. And it's got <laughs> keep your filthy bones out of my mouth. <laughs> Stick a finger in the in yeah. the nose. I think uh it, it must have taken a while to <laughs> This. <laughs> yeah well oh and they God, said sorry, for I'm this scene but... that bruce campbell is like the king of backwards acting because a lot uh-huh. of these were done in reverse probably never one. know yeah yeah <laughs> noogie 
Uh oh. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, he's had enough. Yeah. All right. Uh, the original uh, working title for this movie was Mid Evil Dead. Yeah, that's which, what I said. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, it was in my my handwritten notes here, but uh, that would have been a great play on words. Mid Evil. Yeah. Of course, spelled M I D E V I L. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but he guess got what? Put together Evil like Ash. a puzzle. Yeah. So if deadites can do that, uh, that seems like a problem, right? I mean, you can't really kill them then. Well, I think they can only do that when he misspeaks the words and raises the army of the dead. Oh, this Evil Ash line here, I live again. Yeah. I mean, if you're like me, you probably played Blood. That's that's what the character in Blood says at the beginning of the level. He comes out of his like coffin and you hear him say, I live again. What's Blood? Oh, it's a first person shooter ga- game from the late 90s, I think. Oh. You never played it? It was in the same engine as Doom and stuff like that. No, I mean, I played like Doom and Hexen and, and uh, that one that came before Hexen. I forget. Yeah, and Duke Nukem, for example. Did you ever play Duke Nukem 3D? A little bit. Yeah, I didn't really like and it. And that much. one, he has a lot of lines from movies, including Hail to the King, Baby, you know, yeah. King Sh- Baby, all that stuff. Yeah. Here. All right. And did you speak the words? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Did he call him dung-eating fool? I always want a spinach chin. I have uh, I have subtitles. Let me just check. I remember seeing this movie in the theater. Oh, the subtitles don't say what he said. That's interesting. Oh. Anyway. Yeah, Dung Eating Fool would be uh, accurate, I guess. Yeah. I, You know, and, and Ash really screwed up, but they also should have gone with him. Why they? Why they just, we're going to wait here and you go, do, you go do this. You'd think that they would want him to have the best chance of success possible. He's the chosen one. You know what that means. It's like all the responsibility for that goes on to the hero. Yeah. That was just pillow talk, baby. Yeah. What part are you on right now? He's saying, you know, where do we start with all the ceremony? and Right. Sooner's all, always better than later, right? And he says, I and see. then the I'm wise men were fools to, yeah. Well, he is not a very sympathetic character. Um, he's supposed to be a bit of a jerk. So yeah. when she calls him a coward yeah. and stuff, it's it's yeah, it, this is character. Yeah, yeah. They, well, he's got a he's got a path of character growth, you know. And when it, when Sheila gets captured, then then that gives him something something to fight for. And yeah, and, uh, did you already see the scene him. with the flying deadite? Y- yeah. Okay. What's that? Yeah, that Flying Deadite, I think I have somewhere in Portugal, uh, I think it was a Fangoria magazine that had this Deadite in the cover. Oh, wow. It's a great, great design for this monster. Yeah. You know, Can B and uh, was Howard Berger and Greg and They described that it had, um, it had uh, sleeves for the arms to go in so that they could manipulate the arms. Or mm-hmm. they could switch the your the person in it could switch their arms out of those arms and put them into the wings to flap the wings. Yeah, and some parts look like they're made in the stop motion animation, right? Mm-hmm. Which I love. All right. I now, love all the stop motion skeletons in this too. Is this you know, back they, at they, that? Um, 
this is back at that cemetery, right? Uh, no, I think they're at the castle. Sorry, when I when I was moving around the movie, I think I got a little uh, separated from the part where you are. Yeah, Sheila just got picked up by the deadite. All right, cool. And it's flying with her right now. Yeah, there we go. And now they're getting out their bows to shoot at it. Yep, the part where he's going over the the wall is uh, definitely stop motion. Yeah. Well, save the girl. Yeah. Meanwhile, back at the cemetery. Yeah, okay. So it sounds like you're in the same place as me now. Yeah. I like that he got this cool-looking armor that looks made out of yeah. bones. Yeah, and I, here's all the stop-motion skeletons. It's like a medieval shredder. Yeah. You there, handsomely Hoist. now. I mean, they make these skeletons feel so alive. It's kind of crazy how the basic yeah. animation they put on them. It's very Harry Harryhausen, right? Oh, yeah. Ray Harryhausen? Yeah. You know, the, the Shredder died in the very first uh, Ninja Turtles comic. But they he's always made out to be this, like, you know, long-term villain of theirs. Did they have any long-term villain in the comic? Not really. So just different adventures that they would go yeah. on? Oh. Well, and I don't know if they ever expected it to go past the first comic book. Mm. But yeah, they Leonardo shoved a grenade in his chest and stabbed him through the chest with his sword and shoved a grenade in him and then pushed him off a building. Uh-oh. Bad Ash is behaving badly. Yeah. I think it worked. I mean... Uh, I think it worked with Shredder being like the Foot Clan and all that stuff. It kind of keeps the theme of the ninja thing going. But, I mean, I never read the comics. I know you're a big comic fan for the Turtles. But I guess in the comics, that could open up the possibilities to many different kinds of adventures that didn't involve the Foot Clan. Well, and the and, Foot Clan had other people take it over after he died. And did Crane? And, and but in the when, when we got into the issues in the 20s they resurrected him and killed him again leonardo decapitated him nice i'll have to get into the turtle someday i was just a cartoon guy when i was growing up mm. oh i hated the cartoon because it was so different sure. from the comics oh yeah for sure and the foot clan were robots all right so Marching on Kendar Castle. Hey, that was uh, Ted Raimi. Yeah, yeah. The he one, the one who's the coward, one. telling him that they should they should run away. Yeah. Run home to mama. Apparently, one of the other uh, during the making of right, they had a scene where they said Ted Raimi does that character that we that you just said about that. Oh, we should run. Yeah. And then in the next scene after the rallying cry, he plays another character that says, I'll give you my sword. Yeah. And, the one who whipped him and uh, my sword yeah. by your side. And when they were shooting, Ted Raimi lifted that his arm and said, Oh, and you'll know, have my sword. And then Sam Raimi was like, shut up, man. You were just the biggest coward in the world a minute ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or no, he says, uh, he says, you, you can count on my steel. That's yeah, it. that that's the one that's Ted Raimi, not the not the one who whipped him. That's it. Yeah, they look kind of similar. I bet you it got cold in that California desert at night. Yeah, this is oh, the that, place where guy. the that there yeah, there's there's Ted Raimi. Yeah, and this is the, the place where the you know when where the laser disc stopped was when they you know are saying hail. Oh, is that where you had to flip it over? Yeah, I think so. You can count on my steel. And my ox. All right, here we go. I'll bend my bow to your will, sir. <laughs> that was a good impression. <laughs> and this guy's like, gosh darn it, he, yeah. he got my men from me. Okay, cool. He's a little passive, Lord Arthur. Yeah. You could do more. 
All right. They well, at the, some... at the end, though, he's he gets like he's got multiple arrows stuck in him, and he's still fighting. Well, he at one point burns down to a crisp, right, to a burned skeleton, and still comes back. Arthur? No, oh no, no. I, so I was talking about this guy here. No, I was no, talking yeah, about the evil Ash. Arthur was, kept on fighting when he got he had multiple arrows sticking in his back. Oh, this movie's so quotable. Yeah, like I might. Look bad, but I feel good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Rallying, rallying uh, speech. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the Chinese dead pi- or Chinese jet pilot one? I think that's not in this version. Is oh, it? okay. I think that was in the theatrical version. Yeah, there's one where he says, "Yeah, we're going to need more men." And another in the theatrical version he says, "Yeah, and I'm a Chinese jet pilot." Yeah. The Chinese jet pilot one is funnier cuz it's so out of nowhere. It's so <laughs> right. bizarre. Yeah, hey, look, he's got his... chemistry 101. Yes, and steam s- steam something or other. And steam the steam plane operation. It's a good thing he just happened to have that. Yeah, and he had a Fangoria there in the trunk of his car, too, of course. All right, it's time for uh, an invention montage. Yeah. We can take these deadites. We can take them with science. He's basically building a zombie chopper, right? Yeah. Which is what they do in the... um, in those uh, zombie movies where they yeah. have to leave and they have to go into a car, they have to armor up the car and give it some or chopping blades. the A-team, every time they would get locked in a garage with their van and they would have to fix the van up to, so oh they could God. bust out. That sweet black van with that L-shaped um, yeah. painted streak on the side. And he's teaching them about gunpowder, which is probably pretty far ahead of their time. Yeah, but kind of easy to uh, come up with the ingredients at the time, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So that, that tracks. I'm not sure when the Chinese invented gunpowder and what century, but... Uh, Probably way ahead of wherever this is. That's that's two very productive days, right? Yeah, yeah. He trained an army, he made an invention, he fixed a car, and... yeah. Trained everybody, strategized. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like a battle of Helm's Deep going on here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gorgeous. <laughs> They're not me now. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, well, now we'll see which line he says. Yeah. I think I'm going to get into the uh, the the TV series after this because uh, I guess now is the perfect time for me to get into this. Oh yeah! After we just saw all three movies. <laughs> yeah, you just said I need more men. Ah, uh, I love the Scottish. Uh, yeah. Bagpipers here with. <laughs> yeah. How how are they blowing beards. into those? Of course, if they can talk, I guess they can blow into the bagpipes. Yeah. Yeah. Like this guy, like playing flute with a femur. Yeah. <laughs> and they're hitting skulls with bones in it, but it sounds like a drum instead of like tink, 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 tink. I was a little impressed with the amount of extras and uh, horses they put in this scene. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They shot this for 100 days in the summer of 91. Yeah, and then they had uh, they had some kind of trouble with a, a lawsuit against um, was it against Dino De Laurentiis that had this movie sort of shelved for a year. Yeah, I think it was Universal didn't like the ending, right? So, well, no, the, the, it was a it was a lawsuit about something completely different, not even having to do with this movie. 
trying I think to remember. It was a battle what it was. over the rights of the character Hannibal Lecter. From that's Silence right. Yeah, Lambs. that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because he had made Manhunter, and there were some rights issues that they had to resolve, and they fought for yeah. a year until and that. So Silence of the Lambs came out, and he's like, "Oh no, you don't." Yeah. Which I have to be honest, I've never seen Manhunter. Everybody knows Silence of the Lambs, but Manhunter was kind of the one that was not as popular. I might have seen it on TV many years ago. I think it had mm-hmm. Brian Cox as Hannibal Lecter. Oh. Oh, yeah. In 4K, some of these makeups are a little shady. Like, you can see that they're just masks, and you can see the eyes and the mm. skin underneath. But I think it just becomes such a cult movie because it's just so much fun, the, right? This, this mean, version that you uh, – this isn't 4K, this version that we that we're no. watching right now. No, it's okay. not. It's from a DVD version, director's yeah. cut. And I also have this in VHS, but uh, I think yeah. – now I'm wondering if that has the theatrical cut. I think it must have it. Yeah. Yeah, the director's cut didn't come till later. Eva Lash Except is for- looking – grimier by the minute yeah except there were there were laser discs of different you know like that japanese one that i had so that guy with the eye patch is bill mosley hey i, I think I met uh, him sam raimi in, had seen him in uh Ch- texas chainsaw massacre right and uh two. yeah t- texas Ma- t- chainsaw massacre too i got to meet him he was behind me in line uh at the to to meet clive barker for the book signing at in uh, uh, burbank sweet. I love his work on the uh, the Devil's Rejects and uh, oh, yeah. the Rob Zombie films and stuff like that, and of course the Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. Yeah, but he really wanted he really liked the franchise and he wanted to be in this, so he wrote a letter to uh, I think Sam Raimi. Yeah, and then they they got him to be the this captain, right? This captain of the army or something. Yeah. It makes you wonder if, if when they were doing this, that uh, if Sam Raimi ever read The Lord of the Rings. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, here comes the Torch Boy. I would think so. Torch Boy. Yeah, because they got explosive arrows, dude. Yeah. Yeah. You usually running gags happen in threes, right? But there's only Sword Boy and Torch Boy, so it's it's uh, almost not a running gag. <laughs> Uh, this is a Mel Brooks film uh, where Mel, Mel Brooks is playing uh, is playing uh, Louis uh, the French King, and uh, they're walking around the garden. And there's like a and he needs to take a leak, so he calls a pissing boy, and it's a page with a bucket, so he can oh. piss in the garden. <laughs> that always stuck. That's was oh, that's awful. And the funny thing is that the pissing boy looks just like Mel Brooks because it's Mel Brooks too. So oh. there's a whole sequence of them like replacing the king with the pissing boy. I just thought it was hilarious that there yeah. was a pissing boy. Yeah, Whammo. and w- so in this scene with all the exploding skeletons and and uh, they only wanted to have like three or four, um, mm-hmm. Dino De Laurentiis did. And he's like, it doesn't move the plot forward. And, and Bruce Campbell's like, yeah, but it's cool. Yeah. And and I, I think mean, that's a really good point. I mean, a lot of this movie is just, you know, really cool spectacle. And, and Bruce Campbell really carries it. Retreat. Mm-hmm. Why the hell are the skeletons retreating? I don't know, because they don't want to explode. Are... <laughs> I like how... Is this mo- do they say in this movie at any time? Because I forgot. Do they say in this movie like you can't kill what's already dead? No, I don't think so. Because usually that's something that comes up when there's like a skeleton. It's like right, oh, we yeah. can't kill them because they're already dead. But it's yeah. like in this one, no, you can kill them. <laughs> yeah. Hey, they got Fred Flintstone's car. <laughs> yeah, right. Or no, I think that's Barney's car was the one that looked like a big log. Yeah, pointy log. Oh, I just found out inside the car trunk, apart from the issue of Pangoria, there's also an issue of Dark Horse Presents 5th Anniversary Special Comic. There we go. 
Oh, that that uh, that did the the events of the movie. Yeah, it was in the car. It was just apart from the Fangoria. There was also another book. Oh, oh, okay. Apparently, um, Bernard Rose is in this film. He has a little cameo. Oh, really? Yeah, it says here. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't see anything about that in the. Um... Yeah. So, Army of Darkness is co-written by Sam Raimi's brother Ted. Ted plays the frightened warrior, dis- uh, desperate to stay alive, the eye patch swordsman, the man who screams, "You can't count on my steel," and one of the store clerks at Smart. As for other members who appear in the fa- uh, family members who appear in the film, there's the fake Shemp characters are played by Bruce Campbell's father Charlie and oh. brother Don. The others are played by fellow horror filmmakers William Lustig and Bernard Rose. I didn't know that. I didn't know uh, that. Yeah, I, I wasn't really prepared. I don't know if I would even know where to, you know, where to point him out. Yeah. But that's cool. I'm sure. Another they, Clive Barker. Especially if they have, uh, like, fake Clive Barker connection. Like yeah. You know, and, and honestly, I think what Clive Barker had said about the Evil Dead movies in, in, uh, in the um, A to Z of horror was that he he liked the horror to be a little more serious and he didn't like all, you know, he said he could appreciate all the crazy camera a- angles and stuff, but I, I, well, I don't think this, this kind of stuff was his favorite. All right, Ryan. So a little Dungeons and Dragons question. So are, are skeletons supposed to be uh, vulnerable to blunt damage? Yes. There we go. That's and it why depends on what edition you're talking about. But like, yeah, in the current one, they're they take double damage from blunt weapons. Yeah. Oh no! When I first started playing D anD D again after like thirty years of not playing it, and I didn't know about metagaming as a an issue, right? And I'm like, oh, skeletons! I'm gonna turn my sword backwards and hit him with the you know hilt, and they're like. Would your character know that? Like, that's uh, that's I an important not. distinction, right? Because you're bringing yeah. in knowledge from other games into your game. Yeah. Right, they're yeah. in. But, they you know, through. the last time I had played was in junior high, and we didn't care about things like that. Sure. I mean, it's just for fun, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's when you're playing that kind of game as as an adult that you tend to take it more seriously, and you tend mm-hmm. to be more, you know... Yeah, more Cause, well because uh, everybody's supposed to be rules. creating a story together, right? And the sequence is very well choreographed. I think. Yeah, I, those deadites, um, yeah, look pretty good. Yeah, they had. They said they had some that they called hero deadites that could do that looked really good up close and could do more stuff, and then other oh. ones that were meant for the background. He gave them the the training in like twenty four hours. Yeah, the Spartan training. You know, I um, there's a interesting channel on YouTube for a guy called uh, Shadiversity, or Shad S H A D. He uh, he talks about castles and medieval medieval weapons and how castles were constructed to have defensive and you know defensive measures and all mm-hmm. that stuff and how they worked. There's a lot of interesting stuff that castles used to have in the battlements like places where they could drop like boiling oil or oh yeah water. my brother is really into that stuff. Oh, that's good good stuff. Yeah, you should enjoy that channel Shadowversity. Hmm. And then he has a series on where he um, analyzes the uh, historical accuracy of computer game castles. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which so, spoiler alert, they're not very well uh, <laughs> yeah, designed. Sure. The this um I I thought that was interesting how, how uh Arthur thought that he was, you know, running away because he was a coward. But he actually yeah. was just going to get this. I it's guess Arthur almost forgot Mad about Max sequence. Yeah. Arthur forgot about the zombie smasher car. I, I just <clears> love <throat> this this Mad Max car. It's just crazy yeah. and wild. Yeah, and Bruce Campbell said that, that, that Sam Raimi has to put that car in every single one of his movies, even like the one that was a western, the Quick and the yeah. was it the Quick and the Dead? He turned it into a wagon, I think. Yeah. Yep. Oh man, I love the whistle, the steam whistle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. 
and and the little noises like when when deadites get hit you hear that little whistling yeah <whistles> boing you know little yeah. cartoon sounds yeah cuz it's like the 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 turbine engine is getting really close to them uh oh here comes the part where he gets mesmerized by the i know wait is she he doesn't want he doesn't want to hit her with the propeller blades right She's uh, Sheila. Mm-hmm. That's it, yeah. Was her head on backwards there? No, I don't think so. No. Yikes. Good sequence, though. Yeah. So much for the car, of course. The tactical yeah. advantage has to be set back. Yeah. Man, Bill Mosley is unrecognizable. Yeah. With all that makeup. Yeah. I would love to have a figurine of that character, though, because I oh, really yeah. think that character looks great. That helmet and the yeah. white eyes and the he is cool. bloody mouth. <laughs> uh, I'm going to break my bones. Smash. <laughs> oh. They put that uh, stock effect sound of a broken jug. Yeah, when the when the skeletons smash. Ooh. Uh, camera and the spear trick. Yeah. I he does these shots sometimes that have this kind of hyper reality to it. It looks like he he hot, shoots it in high speed. Yeah. And, yeah. So if the stakes here are if if the deadites could get the Necronomicon, I guess then they could open the portal forever and and conquer yeah. the world. It's interesting because in the Evil Dead one and two, they didn't seem to care about getting a getting a hold of the book. Yeah, because they didn't know. Well, I think they knew it was around because that's what summoned them there. Yeah, the pages, right? Yeah, yeah. And the beginning, he does explain that uh, it was a foul thing, never meant for the world of the living. Yeah. Look, he's holding his lower jaw uh, by tying it to his head. Yeah. Uh, man, that helmet is sweet, though. Yeah. I wish someone could make that helmet. It's uh, kind of like the the Kurgan's helmet in in uh, Highlander. It is good. Good point. Well, good observation there. Smush. There's one called Condor among them. Yeah. All right. That's what I would call a hero deadite right there. Yeah. Yep. Because what you see when um when they're actually on scene, dressed up as 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 guys, they have uh they have a lot more meat on their bones yeah. than the uh, animated skeletons. So I would imagine Sheila's state is the same as like Ash had when he got possessed by the demon right the yeah because it's like it's yeah there's a little bit of fudging there about like what you can do to somebody who's like a main character when they're undead or because mm -hmm. they can turn back and other people you chop them into bits and stuff but yeah you honey you got real ugly yeah <laughs> and oopsie daisy yeah so you would think stabbing her and throwing her over the castle wall would have been enough to to you know kill her so she's not coming back but who knows I don't nobody understands how this works It's the same thing as like uh when the deadites look all gnarly and bloody and scratched yeah. but then they can make themselves look normal again Yeah yeah they, that's true they can yeah. So that they can try to fool the living could be part in, of their uh illusion 
I don't yeah. know. And like I said, I mean, this guy is gonna is gonna fall off the wall, burning yeah. to his death, and then he's gonna climb back back up the wall as a as smoking skeleton. Yeah. Oh, this this grabbing the blade with his metal hand is just yeah. kind of samurai grindhouse grindhousey, right? There's there's yeah. movies I've seen where the guy is the samurai goes in for the death blow, and the other guy just catches the blade with his two hands. Yeah, which would never happen, but sure. <laughs> I love the rail kills. Oh. The amount of physical work that uh, yeah. that Bill Campbell had, uh, Bruce Campbell had to do in this, this is it's, like it's Errol Flynn kind of sword fighting. Yeah, right. What like those pirate movies and stuff? Yeah. Swash buckling. I'm sure that line is not in the TV version. What 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 line? You're pissing me off. Yeah. Smack. Well, there, there's one line where he says, "Get the fuck out of my face," which is like, but I think they're allowed to say say that like one time in a PG-13 movie. Right. But it's mo you know, I think for the most part this this really could be a PG-13 movie. And they wanted it to be because it's an adventure movie and not a horror. I mean, movie. nowadays it definitely would not be R. I don't yeah. think this would be R nowadays. Well, I think it was unfair. Yeah. And, and uh, made, something made on it- fire. You know, and, and they would have gotten a lot more uh, a lot more ticket sales if this was PG thirteen. Bamo. I mean, I'm going to go with this movie made a lot of money anyway. So. Oh, I don't think I. I think in in the theater, I think it just paid for itself, but I don't think it made a lot of money. Yeah, but probably in in, in home entertainment. I mean, this made a oh, killing, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, it's it's a now it's a cult, you know, a cult hit, but. Yeah. At the time in the theaters, I don't think it, you know. I did see this. I remember now. It was, I think, I saw this at a matinee uh, in the theater. Um, For like $2 or whatever? Yeah, $3. something like that. Matinees now are like 10 bucks, but back then they it was pretty cheap. Oh, yeah, especially if you went to those old-timey inner city, like, you know, city. Yeah urban theaters right yeah. where you could just walk down the street to a little theater and watch it yeah and their sound is just two great big like speakers yeah i think this came out in the fall in october or something or november I think so. yeah i'm trying to remember what else it was up against in the theater at that time huh well in Portugal, I remember the other movies that were around were different because it, it, it took months for a movie right, to go yeah. from. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you can look that up. He's breathing fire on him. Where did he get that ability from? It's it's a dead eye trick, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they even did the little eye slot machine kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, he just fell like twenty feet onto his back. Okay, looks like I saw this movie at the Fentes Porto Film Festival in February of '93. That's uh, okay. That would have been because I used to go to this festival every year. It was a fantastic film festival. It was uh, in in the city. Uh, about 20 miles away from where I lived. So that's a year after it came out. Yeah. That's that's probably when I saw it on the theater. Yeah. Yeah. So did it have Portuguese subtitles? I think it did not have any subtitles. Because oh, it was okay. like one of those like film festivals. And so this, this was the first time that this was being premiered in Portugal. 
Yeah. So I don't think it had subtitles yet. I think they just do, had like do a, enough a, people a, in Portugal speak English that you don't really need that. I mean, yeah, in general, I would say the people, the young people who are going to these movie festivals, they probably know enough English not to have to worry about subtitles. Yeah. Yeah. Bonehead. Yeah. <laughs> Ow. There we go. <laughs> oh, this this steam engine like whistle is just fantastic. Yeah. The lemo. Yeah. Okay, there's Buckle no better up, way for you're going for a ride. There's no better way for a villain to get killed and put in a catapult and blown out in the air. Mm-hmm. Hey, Sheila's back. She's fine. Yeah. She does not have a spear through her stomach. Yep. It was the evil Sheila that was hurt. Mm. The good Sheila is <laughs> right. fine. <laughs> yeah, try not to think about it too hard, I guess. All right. So, yeah, this one didn't have him uh, going after the other guy, right? No, yeah, he never went and asked him to... Yeah, I think that that scene would make a lot more sense. It, yeah, it would have been nice if it had stayed in. Because, you know, it, it was easy to believe that he could go grab the other guy to help because yeah. they're all on the same side fighting the forces of evil, even though they might yeah. have political differences. Well, and he didn't say yes. He just seemed like he was going to think about it yeah. in the deleted scene. So it's still there still would be the same tension and stuff. Also, sometimes having a bigger menace is a way of putting your problems into perspective, right? Yeah. They're like, yeah, turns out we did a good job. We fought together. Yeah. Maybe we're not so different. When I saw this movie the first time, I think I might have thought that this was supposed to be King Arthur. Yeah, right, right. Because it's like, hey, it's old England, and this guy's called Arthur, and he has a king. I was like, where are the Knights of the Round Table? Yeah, and the, the it's Kandar instead of Camelot. All right, so this is this is where the alternate ending starts to be starts to uh, kick in, right? Because yeah, here he's saying, here have this potion, take six drops, one for every century. Yeah, because it's the thirteen hundred, so he's going back to the nineteen eighty whatever, yeah, or nineteen ninety or whatever, yeah. But in the other ending, he just has to drink a potion and say the words, and then he goes back to his time. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Which, even though, so I like both endings, and I would appreciate it. Would have, you know, it would have been nice if they'd gotten the ending they wanted, and then they would have made Evil Dead Four, which took place in a post-apocalyptic world where Ash was fighting against the Evil Dead with an army of robots. I, I, I would give my left not to see that. I'm going to be I honest. Know. But because of what happened with the ending, that changed everything. They never made, you know, except for remakes, they didn't make it another movie. Yeah, that's why now I've got this need for more arm, for more Bruce Campbell and more yeah. Ash vs. Evil Dead. So now that I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can get that uh, TV show and start watching it. Yeah, I might watch it again, too. I've got the first two seasons on Blu-ray, but I think I never bought the third season. I think I just watched it on streaming. I like that he uh, he asked them to bring his car with him into the the yeah. cave. Like, hey, he needs a vehicle when he gets back to his time. Yeah. Okay, so he seals himself in the cave, yeah. and his plan is to sleep it out, pull... Um, What's the name of that story of the guy who sleeps for centuries and uh Rumpelstiltskin? Is that what it is? Yeah. I think that was the the midget the the imp that you have to guess his name. There was one. It yeah. was a story, some kind of story of a guy who has to sleep for a long time. I thought that was the same guy. All right, I well, guess that must be it then. We'll hear from our listeners probably. All right. Well, so did so did he leave the the headlights on for this whole time? 
I'm going to guess his battery's going to be dead when he Yeah, in like 20 up. minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was thinking about Rip Van Winkle. Did you oh, see Rumpel There we go. Yeah, I did. You're right. It's, it's Rip similar. Van Winkle. Yeah. Okay, this ending, in my copy, there's a lot of scratches and pops on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> because it was rest- it was kind of restored into there, you know, from a film or I don't know what. Oh, look, we see the seasons moving. Yeah. yeah. Bruce Campbell turned into Alan Moore. <laughs> right. Yeah, and he got distracted by like a rock falling or something, and so he he counted the number five twice or something like that. Oh, that was it. Yes, you're right. Yeah. So he ended up having one extra century. Yeah. At least his scratches are all healed. Yeah. You know, the white streak in his hair seems to have disappeared. Oh, it's it's there, I think. Is it? Or is that a spider web? It's like, oh, I'm no, out. you're right. It's gone. I'm out. Plastics. <laughs> Manufactured products. Yeah, but... So this makes it seem like he... Uh, Came back to a destroyed London, apparently. Is that the Big Ben? Yeah. And there's weird buildings everywhere. Oh, yeah. I guess if Kandar was in England, that would make sense. Yeah. It's like, I slept too long. Yeah. I would have loved to have seen, like, Ash in the Future fighting robots with a big beard. Yeah. And his boomstick and his chainsaw hand. Yeah. He could have turned it from now. It goes into a f- from fantasy, from comedy to fantasy to adventure to science fiction. Science fiction. That, yeah, that would have been crazy. Yeah. So, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, theatrical ending? Yeah, yeah. So, in of course, in the theatrical ending, he's back in the S Mart. You know, after so he woke up in the correct time, and I think this maybe this is the one that people know more, but. Uh, and then because he uh, misspoke the words when he did the um, when he did the um, po- drank the potion, yeah, and well. the Evil Dead came back with him. So he's trying to do his job at the S Mart, and he's telling people the story of how he could have been king. And then this witch, Evil Dead lady, shows up. He says, "Lady, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave the store." Right, and it turns he gets out in a big gunfight with her. A Kandarian demon. Yeah. And uh, and at the end, he, of course, defeats her after a big uh, acrobatic fight with lots of shooting. Yeah. And uh, Linda's there. You know, everybody comes, you know, gathers up around him in like a little kind of background line. Of no, people. Linda wasn't there. She's dead. Wait, doesn't he kiss her at the end? Isn't no, she that's there? somebody else who says, you know that story about how you could have been king? That's kind of cute. But that wasn't Linda. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, because I didn't see the theatrical for this. Sorry. Mm. But he does have, like, it's a co-worker or something, right? Yeah. Well, I think that that lady was just some shopper. But the co-worker oh, okay. he was telling the story to was Ted Raimi. Yeah, and so he... He just grabs her and hugs her, and she uh, and she holds him, and he says, "Give me a hail to the king, baby." So yeah, that's how the, it ends in the original theatrical ending. Yeah, I liked it. I mean, at the time, I didn't realize um, I didn't realize that uh, that's why the deadites came back with him. Um, I was a little confused oh, yeah. about why they're why they're still there if he destroyed the uh, Necronomicon right. and whatever. But um, but yeah, now that you mentioned that, it does make a lot of sense. Well, and that, Ted uh, Raimi's character says, "Did you say the words right this time?" And he says, "Well, not every syllable, no." And yeah. that's when she shows up. Yeah, yeah. It's like okay, now we're still having this problem because you yeah. didn't you didn't do the right thing. Yeah, you didn't do a very good job. <laughs> yeah. Man, good stuff here. Um, this is a lot yeah. of fun. This is probably one of the fun, funnest, funniest movies we've done for the yeah. uh, A through Z of horror commentary track section. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, a little sad to see that go, but, you know, we I don't know. It, it's probably our longest series we've done. It was, it was yes. A, a to Z of horror commentaries. Because first we did A to Z of horror and we went through every letter of the alphabet in the chapters. Yeah. And then and talked about them. And then we did decided to do commentaries for all the movies. We probably did all this over the course of like five years. That's pretty. That's pretty good. We yeah. it, we did it, uh, and it was ongoing because, yeah. uh, for example, um, Duels of Blood was uh, a more limited series of episodes, and this yeah. one has been ongoing. Yeah, I think we did like right Duels of Blood. We we covered that I think for four years, something like that. Hey, there's Kurtzman, Nicotero. Oh yeah, special effects. Ash and Sheila, makeup by Alterian Studios. <laughs> Skeletal assistance. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, they were, there was a lot of puppeteering and stuff. All right, so this was Z for Zombie and um, yeah. Army of Darkness. I hope you uh, had fun watching the movie uh, along with us. And uh, what else are we doing? Oh, yeah. So let's see. Um. Well, we're going to be doing more news episodes as the news comes in. Uh, more Hellraiser, the Dark Watch commentary, and Quartet of Torment coverage. We got to get to disc three and uh, and um, e- and um, not Evil Dead. Jeez, Hellraiser three. I got to get back into Clive Barker mode. Hellraiser three, <laughs> and then uh, we've got coming up fairly soon. It'll be next month. We're going to be doing another episode of Jericho Squad. Yay. We're going to continue our quest. Uh, I promise I won't forget the words. Yeah, right. So you had a little question here that I don't think we got to that. Um, it's uh, an interesting question that you brought up is like, why does uh, evil Ash have a, uh, a right hand? Right. And I, I, I thought that was an interesting question. So I went back. Oh, yeah. And I went back to the scene outside the windmill where he's fighting while the other head is growing and all that. Mm-hmm. So they go into the forest and then they finally pull themselves apart. Yeah. So and I'm and I think the, when they do that, he's got the mechanical hand. I am about to check that for you. And when he does that. And just so everybody, just so I know for the future, the, the credits are over. Yep. So, okay. yes, I think you're right. I think he's got... He's got a metal hand. Yeah. Yep. He's just but like then, a mirror image of well, Ash. But then when he's, you know, all disfigured and stuff and he gets put back together, you know, like a puzzle, I, from that point on, I think he's got a regular undead hand. Sure. I mean, <laughs> it could be. Gary, grab the hand from a skeleton. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know? Bad Hash has two good hands because when he says that little, yeah. goody, you're goody little two shoes, goody little two shoes. He brings both hands up, and they're both human. There's not a metal hand. Oh, you're right. So I right. guess it's just because he, he grows have, out of yeah. his body. He does have a right hand, a He's normal a right hand. Yeah. And that's why the skeleton also has – yeah, it's a clone. Yep, basically. you're right. But he good does, question there. Yeah. Good question. I went back and I checked. So interesting. He, yeah, but he was, a, he was a mirror image for a while, and then when he grew out of him, I guess he was like a clone. Yeah. I look forward to getting back to uh, Jericho Squad – Go back to our quest for the heart of Abex and I hope you guys have a great weekend. Yeah. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker Podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. You can chat with us on our Facebook BarkerCast listeners group, our Facebook page, Twitter, or our Discord server. The best way to support us is to buy our book, The BarkerCast Interviews, Occupy Midian, available in hardcover on Amazon and ebook on Amazon and Apple Books. Fundraiser 10 is all about Patreon this year. Become a patron to get access to exclusive stuff. Pick an episode topic and maybe even get cool stuff in the mail. You can also buy a t-shirt on our TeePublic store. Go to TeePublic.com and search for BarkerCast. 
Leave a message for us using the Speak Pipe link on our blog. Opening and ending music generously provided by Ray Norrish. Thanks for listening.